January 17, 1953, the first issue of I.F. Stone's Weekly appeared. Circulation, 5,300. McCarthyism was at its height, and Stone was a blacklisted newspaper man whose career seemed at an end. But if there remained no papers he could write for, he would start his own. He began as the researcher, writer, editor, publisher, and proofreader, and he remained all of these for 19 years. I'll tell you one story, if I may. It really is the story of the best uh, scoop I ever got, and how I got it. You know, this whole terrible underground testing miasma really began in the mind of that scientific screwball and real nut, Edward Taylor. Because uh, as, we got, as we got close to an agreement with the Russians, he began to say, well, suppose they uh, test underground, or suppose they test on the dark side of the moon, or suppose they test 50,000 miles out in space. How will you know? How will you know? And uh, the first underground test was held by the Teller crowd in order to show the possibility of hiding uh, testing underground. And, and in the fall of 1967, they held the first test out in Nevada. And I wasn't out there, but I got the Times the next morning. Gladwin Hill wrote the story. And it said that uh, the results uh, seemed to conform uh, to the expectation of the experts, meaning Teller and Ladder and people like that, uh, that, that the uh, test would not be detectable more than 200 miles away. But the city edition I got at home had a shirt tail from Toronto saying that Toronto had detected it. I went downtown and bought the, the uh, late city, and there were little shirt tails, one from Rome and one from Tokyo, saying they detected it. I thought, I thought gee, I, I wish I had some uh, enough money to cable those places and find out what's going on. I didn't know what to do with it. And, and I put it down in the basement with all my back numbers of the times and waited. And then the following spring, on a Tuesday, uh, Harold Stassen, who was Eisenhower's uh, negotiator with the Russians on a test ban agreement, testified before the Humphrey uh, Subcommittee on Disarmament that the Russians were prepared to agree to permit listening posts, scientific listening posts, every thousand kilometers across the Soviet Union. That is about, what is it, 500, it's five-eighths of a mile, about 588, 580 miles apart. And it looked like a real breakthrough for a comprehensive test ban. Two days later, the, the Atomic Energy Commission, which is, in my opinion, the most mendacious uh, uh, government agency in Washington, all, all back to the days when they told us that fallout was good for you, uh, released to the press for publication the following Monday the first official scientific report on the first underground test. And in it, they said that the, the test could not be detected more than 200 miles away. No mention was made of Stassen. The obvious purpose was to make a liar out of Stassen and undercut that agreement. When I saw it, I went down the basement, dug out that old Times, and I called the AEC press office. There were some nice guys in there. And I said, how do you guys reconcile your new report with the fact that the Times, the morning after, reported that Toronto, Tokyo, and Rome had detected on their seismometers? And the guy said, well, Izzy, I don't know what to tell you. We'll try to see what we can find out from Nevada. I'll let you know later. So uh, he said, I'll call you back. So I, I thought, I'd never been on a seismology story before. I thought, where the hell can I find a seismologist? I began to phone around town. I discovered that the Department of Commerce had a coastal geodetic survey, and the coastal geodetic survey had a seismology branch. So I jumped in the car and went down there, and they were so glad to see a reporter. I don't think they'd seen a reporter since no one... <laughs> It was a tremble from Mount Ararat when, when Noah's Ark landed. <laughs> and there was, a lot, there was a wide squiggle on the seismometer. And I said to them, I'm, I'm studying this underground test, and do you think it's true that uh, Toronto, Tokyo, and Rome detected it? And they said, no, I don't, we don't think so. And they showed me how to read a seismometer, and it wasn't too easy to read, you know, all the different... They said, we don't think so. But they said, here are 19 of our stations that we know did detect it with certainty. 
and here are the distances. So I said, do you mind if I copy it down? He said, oh, no, go ahead. So I copy down the length. And one of them was 1,200 miles to the east of Nevada in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and one was 2,600 miles to the north in Fairbanks, Alaska. And they said, why are you so interested? And I said, well, the AEC has just given us a report for publication next Monday saying that they couldn't be detected more than 200 miles away. So when they heard that, they realized they were going to get caught in some kind of bureaucratic snafu, so they clammed up on me. When I got back to the office, the AEC called and said, Izzy, we heard you were just down the Coastal Geodetic Survey. <laughs> we've got, we've got uh, Nevada on the teletype, but it's, it's too late out there by now. It's late afternoon to get the information on tomorrow. So sure enough, tomorrow, they gave me a correction. But they didn't give it to anybody else except my friend Dick Dudman of the Post-Dispatch, whom, whom I let in on the story. And every other paper still had the original report with the original lie in it, undercutting Stassen. It took about three weeks before Senator Clinton Anderson had a special hearing of the, of the uh, Joint Atomic Committee, which was much better than it is today, and this was my great moment, said to Admiral Straws, uh, wasn't it I.F. Stone's story that made you admit that this wasn't true? Well, what's a journalist supposed to do when he is given information by someone in Washington that they sort of want printed, but they don't want to attribute it to them? What do you call that? Well, please use, but don't attribute. Mm -hmm. are, it, all these private briefings are very bad because um, they take the reporter into the family. And once you've had dinner with the Secretary of State and uh, he's asked your opinion about a complex problem and you've told him what they ought to do, uh, you feel like a statesman, and uh, you're a close friend, and you wouldn't think of criticizing the great man. And you understand there's certain things the public ought not to know. Better for them not to know. Now, governments lie, but they don't like to lie literally. Because a literal, flat, and obvious lie uh, tends to be caught up. So what they, what they do is they become the masters of the disingenuous statement of phrasing something in such a way that the honest and normal and unwary reader gets one impression that he's supposed to get. And then three months later he discovers it's not true and he goes back to complain. They say, well, that isn't what we said. Look at it carefully. You look at it carefully and sure enough, it was really double talk. It didn't say exactly what they said. Well, um, that's what I have Stone looked like uh, towards the end of his life. He was probably about 65 or 66 in the section that you saw. Um, he was born in 1907 in Philadelphia on December 24th. Um, his father was a Russian immigrant and uh, he lived in Philadelphia and Richmond, Indiana and Haddonfield, New Jersey as a young man. Uh, and that's significant in the sense that he, he had a very different upbringing from um, most Jewish intellectuals. Uh, and it gave him a different approach to ideology and to intellectual combat and to the left as well because, as he always used to say, if you grew up in a small town like Haddonfield, um, everybody had to get on with each other if you were on the left. The anarchists couldn't feud with the Trotskyists. They couldn't refuse to speak to the communists because there were only about 11 of them in the whole town anyway. <laughs> um, and it was an attitude that he took with him in 1933 when he moved to New York City to become an editorial writer for the New York Post. He went, he went to the University of Pennsylvania for a couple of years and dropped out and became a newspaper man. Uh, he also entered political life somewhat atypically for his generation and cohort through the, through the Socialist Party. So uh, he had a, his, his parents had a dry goods store, a sort of general store, and he had a relatively bucolic upbringing, and in a sense what radicalized him uh, was partly his involvement in the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. These were two, two anarchists who were essentially murdered by the state, uh, framed for a bank robbery and, and put to death. Uh, and then uh, the Great Depression. Um, so uh, he worked in 1928 on Norman Thomas, who was the head of the American Socialist Party, uh, and a great peace activist, Norman Thomas's campaign. Uh, and then in 1933, he moved to New York City and was uh, the lead editorial writer for the New York Post, which in those days was uh, it's now owned by our friend Rupert Murdoch, but um, in those days, it was a 
uh, broadsheet newspaper, not a tabloid, and it had been bought essentially because uh, the New York City had nine English language dailies at the time, and all nine of them were opposed to the New Deal. <laughs> so um, basically activists in the Democratic Party on the East Coast urged a man named David Stern, who was a newspaper owner who also was from Haddonfield, and who had owned the Camden Courier, which was Stone's previous employer, and whose wife was a department store heiress, which isn't coincidental, because if you're, in those days, if you wanted to run a newspaper, the advertising you had to get to survive was department store advertising. So uh, it meant that Stern could go out on a limb a little bit politically, because he knew there was at least one chain of department stores that would never cut their ads from his paper. Um, so he bought the New York Post and turned it essentially into a mouthpiece for the New Deal. So for Franklin Roosevelt's attempt to reform the American system. Uh, the Post was not a radical paper, it was a liberal paper. Uh, and Stone was its editorial voice. But as the 30s wore on and American politics became more polarized, he became more radical and in some ways less comfortable at the Post. And what finally drove him away from the paper was the Spanish Civil War. Because um, the Post was one of the only papers in America that was in favor of the Spanish Republic. Uh, but it was in a market where, because of the power of the Catholic Church, the priests would go out on, uh, on the pulpit on Sunday and tell their congregations to boycott the Post. Uh, and they lost, they lost a lot of circulation and they also lost advertising. They lost advertising from, for example, Macy's department store can canceled their ads because of their, the Post's policy on the Spanish Civil War. And Stone was more and more caught up in the politics of, of Spain and defending the Republic and opposing Franco, uh, and less and less amenable to sort of towing the, the line that his boss was laying down for him. And eventually, uh, he was fired and went to work for the nation. Uh, in those days, uh, a venerable left-wing weekly, <laughs> um, which had been going since 1865. So. Uh, and which was very much to the left of the New York Post, very much pro-New Deal, however, and was in those days, as it probably in some ways still is, a place where the American left has its arguments with itself. So uh, the Post, the, the nation in those days had a book section or a back of the book, a culture section, that was run by a Trotskyist. Uh, and the front of the magazine, most of the contributors were members or sympathizers of the Communist Party. Um, the editor, a woman called Frida Kirchway, uh, was a liberal, uh, and she tried to keep all of these people from tearing each other to pieces, and succeeded pretty well for about 15 years. Uh, and that was the period that Stone worked there, until 1940, when a new newspaper started in New York called PM. And what made PM significant was uh, a few things. First of all, PM uh, took no advertising. It was the first newspaper, first big city newspaper that took no advertising. Instead, it depended on its subscribers um, to pay for it. So it charged more, it charged a nickel when, or five cents when other newspapers charged three cents. Uh, it also changed the way we look at newspapers and the way news newspapers look. It used uh, a photographer called Ouija on a photographer called Margaret Bork White, uh, and they put their pictures big on the front page or big inside, which newspapers hadn't done before. Uh, partly this was because they, they got technology and special, special inks that would take pictures and dry quickly and work on a press, uh, but it was also because they were, they were really sort of at the cutting edge of what you could do in newspaper design. They had a, uh, an editorial cartoonist who had been uh, working in advertising in New York for a a pest control company called Flit. Uh, and he had these weird kind of bug-like creatures that he would draw. Uh, his name was Theodore Seuss Geisel. Uh, and it was after PM gave him his, his start that he quit advertising and became the Dr. Seuss that uh, you know, we know from children's book fame. They had a, a pediatrician who they hired to write a weekly, do, a weekly column about the, the growth of a newborn baby and her sort of developmental guidelines. Uh, and this pediatrician was called Benjamin Spock. And he went on and took those 
columns and turned them into the largest selling child care book in history. Um, they had, uh, they had, you know, sort of war correspondence, they had White House correspondence, and I.F. Stone was their Washington editor and editorial writer. Uh, and he stayed there until PM, in 1948, uh, PM finally ran out of money. Uh, it fought all the way through. It was attacked by other newspapers. They used to, the other newspapers refused for a while. The Associated Press refused to let it carry Associated Press stories. Um, the, the Annenbergs, who owned other newspapers, uh, would pay gangsters to get people to beat up newsstands where they carried PM. They'd get people to throw it in the streets. Uh, so <coughs> it was, there were newspaper wars on the streets of New York, and PM was usually losing those wars. Uh, it, it only made money once. Uh, there was a period in 1947 uh, when I.F. Stone broke the British blockade of Palestine and went from a DP camp in Europe on the illegal immigration to Palestine uh, and wrote about it. And that sent PM circulation uh, above a quarter million for the first time and also into profit for the first time. But it wasn't enough and eventually PM folded. It was bought by another paper which essentially bought the same building and people and carried on under a new name. That was succeeded by another paper. And in 1952 on election day they all ran out of money and Stone was unemployed and unemployable. He had three kids at home, uh, and the other thing that's, that's easy to overlook but definitely worth noting is that starting in 1937, he started to go deaf. Um, so we're talking about in, in 1952, a 44-year-old um, a man, um, 40, what's the math, John? Help me out. <laughs> Well, in his, his mid-40s, uh, with three kids, deaf in one, well, completely deaf in one ear, mostly deaf in the other ear, uh, and who, um, who had had an FBI file that J. Edgar Hoover had started in 1936, um, and who was definitely viewed as far too radical for most American newspapers to employ. Um, so that was the first act of his life. But it, it's worth... Uh, noting a couple of things about it. First of all, uh, although he was unemployed and unemployable in 1952, in 1933 or 1936 or 1937 or 1939, he was a trusted confidant of Roosevelt and the White House. Uh, when Roosevelt decided that the Supreme Court was overruling too many of his laws and he was going to uh, deal with that by nominating new justices and pack the Supreme Court, uh, Felix Frankfurter, who was then a Harvard Law professor, not yet a Supreme Court justice, uh, arranged for I.F. Stone to get a leave of absence from the Post and write a book about the Supreme Court, his first book, um, in order to basically, it was a kind of left attack on the Supreme Court. Um, so he, he was someone who had had tremendous influence and who was someone who was very much an insider. Uh, one of the things his FBI file talks about constantly is the way he would walk into government offices in Washington, go down to an empty desk, sit down, put his feet up and pick up the telephone and start using the telephone to do his reporting. Um, the FBI thought he was far too comfortable and far too arrogant. Uh, but it means that uh, when he started his second act uh, in 1952, he knew how journalism worked, and he knew how mainstream journalism worked. Uh, and what he did in 1952 is he started something that looked like this, except instead of saying bi-weekly, it said weekly. Uh, it was a four-page news, newsletter. What he did is he took his, the people who'd bought his books, the mailing lists from those, and he sent out a form, and he got 5,300 subscribers, um, which was not quite enough to break even, but it was enough to start. And he started, and by the end of the second year, he was making money. He had 7,000 subscribers. Uh, it cost $5 a year. And it was all written by him every week. So uh, that's what he did for the next 19 years. Uh, he turned out this newsletter. And he started it just at the, at the height when Senator McCarthy was just at the height of his power. So um, it was a terrifying time in the United States, and particularly a terrifying time in Washington. 
Uh, and Stone, his son told me that he hated Washington, but he felt he needed to be there because that's where his stories were. Um, but it, it also meant that uh, if you subscribe to I.F. Stone's Weekly, you would get visited by the FBI. You would get called. You, would get, you, you knew you would get an FBI file because subscribing to this was enough to mark you as a dangerous radical. The, in the clip we saw, he talks about giving the story of the atomic testing uh, uh, lie to his friend Dick Dudman. Well, I interviewed Dick Dudman, who was all, who's still alive and runs some radio stations in Maine, but was a reporter and a columnist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch for about 40 years. And he told me a story about when he moved to Washington in the 1950s. He said he'd known Stone from the late 40s because he'd gone, he was doing a piece on, uh, on Europe and on DP camps, and he'd gone to see Stone because of Stone's series. Uh, and uh, Stone gave him some advice, but also said, you're, you're not a good enough reporter, you won't get this story. Uh, but that, that didn't put Dudman off either the story or Stone. And he moved to Washington in the 50s. He became Washington bureau chief for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which is a mainstream, down the line, but vaguely democratic, vaguely liberal newspaper. Um, good paper. And uh, he invited, he had a dinner party. As bureau chiefs do. He invited all of his contacts and he invited I.F. Stone. And he said a man came into the kitchen uh, in, in, at this party and he said, you can't, how can you do this? How can you invite me to a party with I.F. Stone? I could lose my job if I'm seen. So there was a, there was a, a climate of incredible fear in Washington. Uh, and people really relied on Stone's Weekly both to stick up for their rights, to tell them what was happening in other cases. And also just to tell them what was happening in the world, because the, the media in general had been so cowed and reported so little of what was actually going on that people really depended on, on I.F. Stone's Weekly. Um, and then Tom Wicker, who's the narrator of the film, has a nice line in the film where he says uh, that, that it took the Vietnam War for the rest of America to catch up with I.F. Stone. And that's true, uh, that, that Stone... Stone lived in France in the early 50s, before he started the weekly. He lived in Paris for a year uh, as a foreign correspondent. And when he came back, he kept the habit of reading French newspapers. So he read the French accounts of, of Dien Bien Phu, and he read the French accounts of, of their defeat in Vietnam. And when America started sending troops into Vietnam, uh, which, as Stone knew, it did very early on. It sent advisors in the, in the 50s, and Truman sent people in the 40s. Um, he was watching, and as it said in that little clip, you know, I, I put it down in my stack of newspapers in the basement. Well, that stack of newspapers in the basement was a kind of metaphor for his memory, uh, because he, he would remember things. So that when, when in, the, in 1963 or 64, Robert McNamara would say, well, if we had another 100,000 troops, we could end this war in a year, <laughs> He would find some quote from a French general who'd said exactly the same thing in 1953, right before they were defeated in Dien Bien Phu. So, uh, what happened is that uh, essentially the, the circulation of I.F. Stone's Weekly took off in the early 60s. So that he had about 10,000 circulation in, in 1962 or 63. But by 66, it was 20,000. By 68, it was 50,000. By 71, it was 70,000. Uh, and this, w this was very important for two reasons. One, uh, because it was a, a reliable, uh, independent, tr accurate source of information about what, was what America was actually doing in Vietnam. Uh, and the second is because it, I. F. Stone's Weekly gave the anti-war movement in the United States confidence, and it gave them credibility. You had these students who were sort of demonstrating and in the street and knew that they thought the war was a bad idea, but they didn't have a lot of information about what was going on or why it was a bad idea or why the government was lying. And here was I.F. Stone coming along with information week after week after week. Um, I reproduce in my book uh, two issues of the weekly front pages that I think are two of the most important that he published. And one was in August 1964, right after the Gulf of Tonkin incidents. Now these were uh, supposed attacks on American warships that led Lyndon Johnson to go to Congress 
and essentially asked for carte blanche to do what he wanted to retaliate against these supposed attacks. And uh, the entire spectrum of the American news media uh, in 64 believed that these attacks had happened and that they were unprovoked, except for I.F. Stone's Weekly. <laughs> Within two days of the first attack, we, the Weekly came out and it said, we discuss, everything is discussable except the possibility that these attacks were provoked. <laughs> in other words, that America had warships off the coast of North Vietnam that, was, that were uh, engaging with North Vietnamese ships, that were bombing North Vietnamese installations. Um, this was stuff that, that Stone gleaned, not through secret sources, not because he had uh, anybody had leaked anything to him, not because people told him confidentially, but because he read the public record. He read, and he listened to, you know, he read French newspapers, which were reporting, which were reporting on this. He read British newspapers, which were reporting on this. He read Australian newspapers, which were reporting on this. Um, and the second thing, the second, and then within two weeks, uh, when, they, when McNamara came before, who was the defense secretary, came before Congress and offered and claimed that this had been an unprovoked attack, Stone pointed out that this, this attack, this supposed attack, there was no damage to the ship except for one bullet hole, there was no debris in the water, and there was no, not even the soldiers in the ship claimed to have seen anything. Uh, it took, the pe it took till 1994 for what, for McNamara to finally admit publicly that the second attack had never happened, it had just been a fabrication which he'd known at the time. But by then, you know, millions of Vietnamese and 50,000 Americans had died in Vietnam. So, um, you know, that's one, I think that was one very important issue of the weekly. Another very important issue of the weekly was, uh, two years later, the State Department issued a white paper on Vietnam, which was supposed to, uh, well, I guess the best analogy would be with that dodgy dossier um, that we've had here, is the idea of the white paper was to, to lay out all the evidence for, uh, for why the North Vietnamese were entirely tools of the Chinese. And, and sponsored and sponsored and controlled by Peking, um, and what Stone did is he he demolished the white paper by reading it backwards. He said, "If there's uh, the best way to read a government report is from the back, because they always put the stuff they don't want you to see at the back." <laughs> so, in Appendix D of the State Department white paper, there was an inventory of weapons that had been captured over the last year. Uh, by the uh, by, the Army of, of the Republic of Vietnam, so the South Vietnamese Army, and Stone noticed that of all of these weapons, five percent of them had been made either in East Germany or Czechoslovakia or China. Ninety-five percent of them had been made in the United States or France. Um, that, in other words, the North Vietnamese were essentially getting their weapons by capturing them from from uh, South Vietnamese Army units. Uh, and again, this was what it meant is that the the timing of the white paper was meant to rationalize a vast escalation in the number of troops. And what Stone, what's one very definite impact of Stone's report in the Weekly was that he was invited that week to meet with the leaders of the Students for a Democratic Society and the Anti-Vietnam anti War Memorium, Moratorium Committee. Um, and they, they, they basically said, well, what do you think we should do? And he said, well, this is, you know, there's a war going on and there's no peace movement. There's no anti-war movement. Uh, you know, we should, you should be visible and, and you should try and get public support for this. And so they decided to hold the first of the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and Stone was the only person invited to speak apart from Wayne Morse, who was a, a senator, uh, who was over the age of 30. Um, so essentially what happened is uh, the mainstream caught up with Stone and by the time the weekly stopped publication in 1971 he was in many respects uh, being lionized in the United States. He went on to be a much respected and in some ways loved figure but you know the problem with our icons is that we, we homogenize them uh, and so part of the reason I wrote the book was to point out what a radical he was all his life, uh, and to sort of take this statue down from the pedestal and show that he was uh, he was a radical. He was a real, genuine human being. He had 
flaws and weaknesses like anybody else, and that, um, that what he did could be replicated. And I guess that's where we come to, uh, to what makes Stone valuable now, is that here was a person operating uh, very much at a disadvantage. You know, not only was he deaf, uh, but he was a pariah. Nobody in Washington would talk to him. So, um, so how did he do it? Well, he, he, he was an investigative reader, uh, as my former boss, Victor Navasky, used to say. So he would go through government documents, and he would look for the truth that was in there, but that nobody was highlighting. Um, as he said in the film, and that's why I play the second clip, governments lie all the time. In fact, there's a famous quote of Stone's. He says, all governments lie, um, and nothing that they say should be believed until proven otherwise. Uh, he liked to go on and on about how governments lie, but he also said that, um, that governments lie, but they don't lie to themselves. So that if you look at what one branch of government tells another branch of government, somewhere in there you'll have to, they'll have to put the truth because they have to keep themselves informed of what they're doing. Uh, he did all of this before there was a Freedom of Information Act, before there was an internet, um, and he did it by standing his ground, sticking to his principles, and by digging and digging and digging, uh, by being relentless. And I think those are, you know, those are all uh, characteristics that any journalist can and should emulate. Um, I'm going to close by reading you a little bit of uh, the book, just so you can get a little flavor of it. Uh, and this is a, this is a piece that um, starts in 1961. Uh, and it starts with a, a British woman, Dagmar Wilson. Now, Dagmar Wilson was a children's book illustrator. Uh, if you look, if you look in sort of old bookstores, and you come across something called the Big Book of Zoo Animals, she illustrated that. Uh, the cover is a London bus. So, um, but she happened to be living in 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 uh, Washington, and uh, she was coming back from summer vacation with her husband and children, and she was a subscriber to I.F. Stone's Weekly. Uh, and so, uh, this is where I'm going to start. Driving back from summer vacation with her husband and children, she heard a radio news report on the confrontation between the two nuclear powers over Berlin. When the family arrived at home in Georgetown, she found the September 11th to 18th, 1961 issue of the weekly on top of the pile of mail. Above the masthead, and taking up half the front cover, was a dramatic appeal from Bertrand Russell. And this is Russell's appeal. The populations of East and West, misled by stubborn governments in search of prestige and corrupt officials, corrupt official experts bent on retaining their posts, tamely acquiesce in policies which are almost certain to end a nuclear war. Kennedy and Khrushchev, Adenauer and de Gaulle, Macmillan and Gateskill are pursuing a common aim, the ending of human life. You, your families, your friends, and your countries are to be exterminated by the common decision of a few brutal but powerful men. To please these men, all the private affections, all the public hopes, all that has been achieved in art and knowledge and thought, and all that might be achieved hereafter, is to be wiped out forever. Izzy and Esther had stayed with Russell and Edith Finch, Russell's American fourth wife, at their house in London on the way back from an earlier trip to Geneva. Three days after the Stones returned to Washington, the 89-year-old peer began a seven-day jail sentence for refusing to call off his campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience. For Wilson, American-born but British-educated, Russell's imprisonment was an outrage. When she asked Sane, Sane was an American anti-nuclear group called the C Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, and it was, um, it was a good group, but it was terrified of being red-baited. It was terrified that anybody might say that there were radicals in it. So if, if it emerged, if you were a Sane activist, and it turned out that you had ever been in the Communist Party, they expelled you. Um, when she asked Sane how it planned to respond to Russell's imprisonment, she learned that no protest was planned. Wilson was stunned. Three days later, she and four other women gathered in her living room. Perhaps we told ourselves that night it was time for women to speak out. Leafing through their address books, Christmas card lists, and contacts in PTAs, church and synagogue groups, women's clubs, and old line peace organizations, the five women spread the word from coast to coast. We strike against death, desolation, destruction, and on behalf of life and liberty, said their call to action. Husbands or babysitters take over the home front. Bosses or substitutes take over our jobs. 
For a group of housewives to presume to speak on questions of nuclear strategy was unprecedented. Just as remarkable, however, was what the early communiques of Women's Strike for Peace didn't say. That was the name of their group, Women's Strike for Peace. There were no leaders or officers, no organizational structure, and though the group announced plans to present petitions to both Jacqueline Kennedy and Nina Khrushchev, WSP was open to any woman who supported its aims. Only two years earlier, Norman Cousins had fired a New York SANE organizer who took the Fifth Amendment before the Senate Internal Security Committee. After bitter debate, SANE's board issued guidelines barring current or former communists from membership. <coughs> that was when Bertrand Russell withdrew his membership, his sponsorship from, from SANE. Wilson and her friends, along with most of the Washington chapter, regarded the purge as a capitulation to the Cold War, and they were determined that the women's strike for peace would be different. There would be no political litmus tests, no formal requirements for membership, indeed no membership lists at all. Every chapter would have autonomy. As a husband, Stone commented in the weekly, we are alarmed at this move toward the unionization of women, but we hasten to approve. On November 1st, 1961, some 50,000 women walked out of their kitchens or off their jobs. In dozens of local actions across the country, women pushed baby carriages, carried placards, marched, and rallied. In Los Angeles, 4,000 women assembled on the steps of the State Building. In Washington, 700 women, several children, and one dog picketed the White House. <laughs> In New York, twin marches targeted both the Soviet Embassy and the Atomic Energy Commission. Ten weeks later, when 3,000 WSP women filled both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, I.F. Stone was there too, wishing, quote, every reader could have seen the demonstration. The good humor, the brightly painted signs smeared by the rain, the multicolored balloons they carried made a vivid and inspiring sight. I recognized why they were here, President Kennedy told a news conference Stone attended that afternoon. There were a great number of them. It was in the rain. I understand what they were attempting to say. Therefore, I consider their message was received. Uh, and indeed, I go on to talk in the book about the sort of political fight that eventually led to the first nuclear t anti t the first nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, but if the message was received at the White House, it was also received by others who were less happy to uh, to have it. Uh, so this is the next and last bit I'll read. The subpoenas arrived at the beginning of December summoning Dagmar Wilson and 13 women from New York to testify before the House Committee on American Activities. Three of the recipients weren't even WSP activists, belonging instead to a New York peace group formed by those who'd resigned from or been expelled by SANE. One was Elizabeth Moose, who had already been named as a card-carrying communist at the trial of her former son-in-law, William Remington. That had been a decade earlier, but a HUAC subpoena was still a serious matter. A RAND Corporation study published that same December warned that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the peace movement was a, quote, growing cause, singling out WSP for particular concern. There is nothing spontaneous about the way the pro-Reds have moved in on our mothers, charged the Hearst columnist Jack Lotto. Midge Dechter, Midge Dechter, by the way, is, um, was the wife of Norman Podhoritz, who edits, edit, used to edit commentary. Uh, his son John Podhoritz is still a columnist for the New York Post. The, the views of the family are very much uh, unchanged. Midge Dechter writing in Harper's smeared the group as anti-US dupes or worse. When the hearings on communist infiltration into the peace movement opened on December 11, 1962, it soon became apparent that QX members were about to get a lot more than they bargained for. Chairman Francis Walter received more than 100 cables from WSP women around the country volunteering to testify before his committee. Uh, you either had to, to, to plead the Fifth Amendment, which gives you the right against self-incrimination, uh, from the beginning, or you had to answer all of their questions. If you didn't answer all of their questions, you'd be cited for contempt and you could be sent to jail, and people were sent to jail. Many people were sent to jail. But in a way, part of the method of HUAC was not necessarily to send you to jail, but to get you to take the Fifth Amendment, because then your employer would fire you and you would be unemployable and you wouldn't get a job again. Um, so to volunteer to testify was unheard of, uh, but that's what WSP did. The cables were in response to a suggestion in Memo, the group's newsletter, that WSP turned the tables on HUAC. Barbara Bick, the editor of Memo, Memo had been a friend of I.F. Stone since he'd gotten her thrown out of college 15 years earlier. She'd been a, his intern, essentially, when he worked at PM. <coughs> and she'd smuggled a government document to him and that had gotten her thrown out of college. I think he and Esther felt a little guilty, without any reason. 
They were always warm and protective of me, Bick said. Bick had worked for the People's World, the Communist Party's West Coast paper, but she and her husband left the party before they came back east. We never became anti-communists. We just didn't want to be part of that anymore. Bick didn't receive a subpoena, but it wouldn't have mattered if she had. WSP would not, quote, make the error of initiating its own purges. As long as they agreed to oppose Soviet as well as U.S. tests, all the women who subpoenaed would be, would be supported. As Bick points out, Dagmar Wilson was, one, never a communist, two, not Jewish, three, lived in Georgetown, and four, spoke with a British accent. <laughs> Perhaps for that reason, when the hearings opened in the caucus room of the old Senate office building, the subcommittee chairman, Clyde Doyle, reminding his colleagues that all initiated communists know the fight for peace means to destroy capitalism and its major bastion, the United States of America, called a woman named Blanche Posner instead. A former teacher at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, Posner, who managed WSP's New York office, had already been identified as a communist by an informant. Yet when she rose to testify, the audience of WSP women from around the country rose to stand with her. I don't know why, sir, I am here. But I do know why you are here, she told Doyle. <laughs> you don't understand the nature of this movement. This movement was inspired by mother's love for their children. When they were putting their breakfast on the table, they saw not only the Wheaties and milk, they also saw strontium-90 and iodine-131. They feared for the health and life of their children. That is the only motivation. Posner took the Fifth Amendment 44 times, yet she never relinquished the high ground. The WSP hearing was the biggest such affair I can recall since McCarthy, as he reported. It was also the dirtiest. This time, though, the mud didn't stick. I saw a lot of the women strike for peace delegation in Geneva last spring and came away with great respect for them. This was no gathering of party line dupes, and a congressional committee could learn a lot by talking with them in a serious atmosphere. Instead, the women had been baited by committee investigators, most of whom, Sto Stone said, came from the screwball fringe or were ex-hotel dicks. This time, the joke was on HUAC. Doyle admonished the audience not to stand when witnesses were called, so instead they applauded each witness. Toddlers crawled in the aisles, babies demanded and were given bottles, and when Dagmar Wilson, resplendent in a red wool suit, rose to testify, a young woman with an infant on her hip walked over and presented her with a bouquet. Two years earlier in San Francisco, Huack's decision to exclude students had triggered a scuffle outside the hearings and a inside the hearings and a riot outside. The WSP hearings were altogether more decorous. Ladies' Day at the Capitol, said the Chicago Daily News. In terms of HUAC's credibility, though, the results were devastating. Peace March gals make red hunters look silly, said the headline over Russell Baker's sympathetic report in the New York Times. Her block's cartoon showed a clueless committee member asking, I came in late. Which was it that was un-American, women or peace? <laughs> <laughs> when Shuak decides, quote, to smear a half million angry women, it's in deep trouble, thundered the Detroit, the Detroit Free Press. We wish them nothing but the best. For all their matronly de demeanor, WSP, as Eric Bentley later pointed out, represented a new generation come to life. The end of Shuak is a malign force in American politics, wrote Bentley, began with women's strike for peace and Dagmar Wilson a woman with nothing to hide, a woman who disdained to con conceal her views. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's where I'll stop reading, but mm -hmm. uh, I think that's also true of I.F. Stone. He had nothing to hide. He used to say that the reason he was never called before HUAC was because he was like Gypsy Rose Lee, he took it off in public every week. <laughs> um, so anybody who read his newsletter could see what his views were. Uh, he did nothing to conceal them. And it did, it did nothing but help him in the long run. And I think that's a, certainly a lesson for any journalist. The continuity of political generations and the connections between them in the United States is something that we, we hardly ever talk about and that's left out of most history books. And, and, uh, and in a way, more tragically, I think, our sense of ourselves. Um, and I started off, I, first of all, I should say, I never met Stone. Uh, uh, he worked for the nation again in the 1980s, early 80s, but I wasn't there uh, then, and so I only knew him as through reputation. Um, but when I started off, one of the questions that I had in my mind is, how did this guy, who was way out on the margins in the 1950s, end up at essentially the head of this vast parade in the 1960s and the 1970s? Uh, and as I look into it, I realize that 
it was really his experience of the 30s that was formative for him, and specifically the Popular Front. And I think, again, that's very important uh, for activists to take on board. That uh, Stone was his sort of, his idea of the peak of uh, left politics in America was that the early 30s when the CIO was being born, when uh, automobile, the automobile industry was being organized and stopped by massive sit-down strikes, when the steel industry became unionized in a matter of weeks without a single strike because uh, they realized that the unions had the power to shut them down if they wanted to, and when all of this uh, power of organized workers was very much uh, in alliance with uh, Roosevelt and the White House. Uh, it's not that they called the shots, and it's not that he told them what to do, to do but they had, they, had a common, they had common goals which they worked towards together, which is why we have things like you know, Social Security and unemployment insurance in the United States. Um, uh, and when they stopped working together, which is the, the Truman administration, uh, because one of the things that Stone always used to say is he, he, he hated McCarthy, but he always thought it was wrong to call it McCarthyism because it, it started with Truman and Truman's loyalty security pro program, uh, where essentially uh, Truman stirred up a red scare basically to neutralize the Republicans and to rationalize continued defense spending. Uh, and it's, this isn't like a mystery or heretical or controversial. You know, Clark Clifford, who was Truman's advisor, told um, uh, Carl Bernstein uh, that they had decided to stir up to do the loyalty security program for purely political reasons. Uh, you know, so it's it's you could look it up, as they say in New York. Uh, but but for Stone, that was that was a tragedy, not just because it derailed the sort of the, the, the coalition that had taken America through the war, but also because it, it stopped in its tracks, for example, things like national health insurance, mm -hmm. which were you know, legislative programs that were very strongly backed by all the unions, of course, uh, and the Truman wanted, but he shot his allies on it uh, and turned them over to the right, uh, and you know, we still don't have national health insurance in the US. So, um, and there's still a red baiting. And there's still, there's still a kind of red baiting that goes on. But I think, you know, uh, it's not that Stone, I should say, it's not that Stone couldn't be critical, and it's important to say this. Uh, he went to the Soviet <coughs> Union in 1956, uh, after Stalin's death. Uh, and he came back and he, he published an issue of the weekly that said, this is not a good society and it's not run by honest men. Uh, and his point was that it was a mistake for the American left to kid itself about the possibility of either working with the Soviet Union under its current leadership or of working with the American Communist Party, which was still in thrall to Moscow. Uh, he, he reported in 1956, he said uh, he thought that, that the last hope for any reformation of the communist system was, was killed in 1956 by Khrushchev's intervention in Hungary. And he said that what happened in Budapest today will happen someday in Moscow. In other words, that there'll be a, a revolt against the Communist Party. Um, so, you know, Stone was perfectly willing to work with leftists of all stripes, but he was also perfectly clear on where he differed with them uh, and where he wasn't willing to go along. He was not someone who was willing to be quiet uh, or to uh, suppress his dissent, uh, either in the left or in general. But he did believe that, um, that when the left worked towards common aims together, uh, they could accomplish much more than if they were riven by sectarian strife, which seems to be more our fate mm -hmm. these days. Yeah. Are, are there any journalists today in America first? you think Sorry. have followed in uh, Stone's footsteps? Well, I think there are lots of journalists um, in some ways who follow in Stone's footsteps. Uh, and actually, the Neiman uh, Foundation at Harvard gives an award every year an Izzy Award for uh, independent journalism, and the Park School of Journalism, which is at uh, in Ithaca, at Ithaca College, uh, gives a, a, an Izzy Award as well for uh, for more for left journalism. Um, and I think you know if you look at the people who won those over the years, uh, Amy Goodman for Democracy Now won an Izzy Award, Glenn Greenwald, who's a blogger for I think Salon, uh, 
uh, won an Izzy Award. Uh, Chris Hedges, who used to be at the New York Times and left, uh, is a great, a great reporter and correspondent. Um, but I think, I think there are a couple of things that it's worth stressing, particularly because um, Stone is often hailed as the first blogger because there's a way in which ISM's Weekly was was like a blog or like an like an aggregator, in that he he wrote it all himself and he took things from other places that he found interesting and put them in these little boxes. Um, so, you know, the hypertext didn't exist, but these are like links. Um, but the difference is uh, that people paid to read it. And I think that's important too. Um, it wasn't much, it was five dollars a year. But what it meant is uh, that what he had to say, people thought that what he had to say was worth paying for. Uh, and they continued to pay for it. And it, it gave him, uh, an, from almost from the beginning, the economic independence to continue. Mm -hmm. And by the late 50s, enough so that when his, uh, his youngest son got into Harvard, he said, well, I, I, I'm going to fill out a form for scholarship. And he said, you don't need a scholarship. We have money. I can send you to college. No. Um, so, because uh, if, you, if you think about what it costs to put out a four-page weekly when you have 5,000 readers, it doesn't cost that much more to put it out when you have 60,000. And if you have 60,000 more readers every year, you know, 50,000 extra readers at $5, at five a year is not a bad income. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a big difference, <laughs> uh, which is that, um, but also, Stone wrote for, he wrote for, um, there was a man called Claude Bourdet who had been in the French Resistance, and then uh, de Gaulle had appointed him uh, the head of French radio, and he founded L'Observateur, which is now Nouvelle Observateur. Uh, but in, the, in 52, when Stone was living in Paris, uh, Bourdet asked him to write about the Korean War for L'Observateur. Uh, so those were the first reports. Um, and they were picked up. Uh, Bourdais said he got more response to those reports than anything else he published at L'Observateur. They were also picked up by the New Statesman. Uh, so, and Stone did write quite a lot for the New Statesman. Uh, there's a fairly, I mean, it's not thick, but there's, the Statesman archives at Sussex have letters from him that I looked at in the course of the book. And he was quite, when he was living in, in Paris, Kingsley Martin, there's a story in the book I tell where Kingsley Martin came to visit, and um, uh, they, he came to dinner. And uh, he said to, to Mrs. Stone, this is, this is a very nice joint. And she thought she was he was talking about their house, but he was talking about the, <laughs> the roads. Um, because he was coming from Britain where there was still rationing, and uh, the fact that they'd managed to get a roast was significant for him. Um, now about the Korean War, in a way, that's the th there, are two, there are two things that the right I mean, one of the things that interested me is that this, I wrote this book, uh, it was published in the U.S. in 2009, and was published uh, here last year. Uh, and uh, as it was coming out in the U.S., there was a huge series of attacks on stone uh, in the right-wing press, uh, mostly retailing the charge that he'd been a spy for the KGB, which, uh, you know, if you're interested, you can look it up on the blogosphere or the internet, because I, I feel like it's too tedious to detail. It's not true, but it takes a long time to deal with it, so I've dealt with it. Uh, but the other one was the Korean War book as evidence that he was a Soviet cat's paw, or that he was a sort of tool of Stalinism or an apologist for Stalin. Um, now, I think that the United States has still not come to terms with the Korean War. Um, and perhaps for that reason, still not to terms with Korea. I mean, we do, after all, have troops stationed there. But Stone's experience, what he did is he, he was in Paris, and he, he used um, a phenomenon that I would call parallax, you know, where you have a different point of view depending on where the observer is. So he looked at the American press reports of the Korean War and the American wires, and he looked at the British and French wires, and he realized that there was quite a gap between the two wars being reported. Um, particularly in France, because the French didn't really have a stake in the Korean War. So they tended to report what was actually happening. Um, and so essentially using nothing but newspaper reports and wire service reports, he analyzed the course of the Korean War and basically pointed out uh, that 
Um, MacArthur continued the war far beyond the point when he could have made peace on the terms that eventually uh, his successor made peace, in other words, on the 30th parallel. Um, and Stone wondered why this was, and he sort of went into that. Um, but the other thing is that the whole experience is, was, was invaluable for him in, in understanding the Vietnam War. Because the same Pentagon lies about, you know, optimistic lies about how long the war was going to take and the course of the war and inflating the enemy. Um, there's a funny chapter, Stone published a book called The Hidden History of the Korean War. There's a very funny chapter in that book called The, uh, the Disappearing Enemy, which he talks about <coughs> the Chinese failure to aggress. That, you know, the Chinese came in and they threw the Americans back, but then they withdrew. And MacArthur would be reporting he was going here, he was going there, there were never, but there were never any reports of engagements with the Chinese. And Stone says, you know, what is behind this mysterious failure to aggress by the Chinese? And why are they doing this? So, um, you know, it, if you, uh, we can say now, we know now, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that North Korea attacked the South. Uh, Stone says that, but he also says that the South may have provoked them in the war. He suggests that. Uh, we know that uh, the North Koreans got Stalin's permission to attack. We know that Stalin. We know now because the Soviet archives have been, you know, released that, um, you know, that Stalin said this was okay and he encouraged it. Uh, so we know that Stone was was wrong about the beginnings of the Korean War, although we still don't know. And one of the things that's that's in the beginning of the book, the Hidden History of the Korean War, is a little thing about the the Taiwanese cornering the soybean market, or trying to corner the soybean market, and how they, they may have made a fortune in soybeans because they, they, they had some inkling that a war was coming. And that's still never been either adequately explained or investigated. So there's, you know, there's still work for historians, there's still work for investigators. But I think um, uh, Bruce Cummings, who, who's the sort of leading American historian of Korea, and who wrote a three-volume history of Korea, um, when the hidden history of the Korean War was uh, reissued in the 1990s, uh, Cummings wrote a foreword, and he said, "You know, this book st still stands up amazingly well. And even knowing everything that we know now, uh, this is still the best book written about the Korean War." So it's, uh, you know, it's it's bracingly radical if you're not used to hearing the American government written about that way. But it's still well worth reading, I would say. Um, I'm gonna. What were his actual politics? That's a fairly easy question to answer. He said he he was converted by Kropotkin to anarchist communism um, as a young man, and the idea of um, of communism without coercion was, I think, something that was very attractive to him as a young man. Um, I have to say that when I started working on the book, and this is one of the reasons I was so confident when the sort of spying charge came along, I assumed I would find out that he'd been a communist because his alliances and associations were just so similar to those of people who'd been communists. And one of the things that I found out as I was researching, and it explained, for me anyway, why his family was less thrilled that I started when I started this than I thought they ought to have been, um, was that all of his siblings were in the Communist Party. Uh, he, he had two brothers and a sister, uh, and they had all joined the Communist Party. And so I then, thought I had to explain, at least for myself, why he didn't. And all I could come up with as an explanation for that is that in the early 30s, there was a magazine called The Modern Monthly, which was published by an American Trotskyist called uh, V.J. Calverton. Um, his real name was Getz, but he's better known as Calverton. Um, and Stone wrote these pieces for The Modern Monthly he wrote a piece called Towards a Soviet America. He wrote a piece uh, saying that um, when Franklin Roosevelt was elected, uh, the only road that could have led to real change in the United States, the road to a Soviet America, had been closed. Um, so he was writing as if sounding like a member of the Communist Party, but he was writing in a Trotskyist magazine at a time when when the Communist Party was vilifying Calverton, the editor of this magazine, as a sex fiend, uh, because you know it was it was the it was the height of the sort of anti-Trotskyist fervor 
within the American Communist Party. So I think in a way, the short answer to why Stone became a, never became a communist is he, he was just lucky. Um, he was sort of in the, in the wrong place at the wrong time because um, his younger brother and his next younger brother and his younger sister all eventually joined and by then he'd sort of been through it. Um, but I think there's something you said that I, I have to slightly disagree with which is you said there was no radical movement for him to speak to. And I think that's where I think the 30s um, were very important for him because the 30s were, in the 30s, I talk a lot in the book and in the introduction I begin with this program called Meet the Press which is still on on American television on Sunday mornings. I mean there are now many more panel programs. But the interesting thing is Meet the Press is like a show of Washington gas bags. You know, reporters and government officials talking. Uh, but when it began, it began on the radio and when it began Ivestone was a regular and in fact its first several years on television he was a regular. Uh, and then uh, essentially he was taken off <laughs> and never went on television again for the next 18 years I say in the book. Um, but that is an indication of where the mainstream was. In other words, you know, in the, in the mid-40s, in 45, 46, 47, uh, right up until Truman's loyalty oath, uh, if you wanted to reflect the mainstream, the sort of dull, ordinary, whatever, uh, generic American political spectrum, you had to have somebody like I.F. Stone on your program. So, you know, he came from a period, he lived through a period when the left was the mainstream. And, and he knew what that looked like. So, I, my mental image of him, and this is really, you, you saw the movie so you know how inappropriate this image is, is as a guy on a surfboard. Um, <laughs> and he's sitting out at sea and it's very quiet and there's nothing happening. But, you know, he's, a, he's an experienced surfer. And so when the swell starts, he begins to paddle. And what I try to do in my book is I try to show that although our image of the 50s is a time of great quiescence yeah. and no political dissent uh, and no radical movements, that in fact you had, you, know, you had the Southern Christian leadership movement and the black civil rights struggle in the South, but you also had this thing which was completely neglected until fairly recently, um, which was the hands-off Cuba movement. Um, you know, that, that the Cuban Revolution was hugely popular in the United States in the late 50s, uh, and particularly on college campuses. There's a great book about this, which I think Verso published, called Where the Boys Are. Um, and it's because there's that movie, Where the Boys Are, with Sandra Dee, and what everybody forgets who's seen that movie, including me, is that it's a movie about a campus trip down to the beaches in Cuba. Um, and uh, so you had you had the civil rights movement, you had, uh, you had the hands off Cuba movement, you had the civil, anti-civil defense movement, you had people from SANE and from things like pre-women's strike for peace. In the 50s you had people refusing to take part. In New York City they had these civil defense drills where in the middle of the day you were supposed to go and assemble and leave your workplace and go to your fallout shelter and people started to refuse to do that and they started to go out in public and refuse to do that. And what Stone could see and I think he could see it because he'd been in a big wave, is he could see that there were all of these swells and that something was happening. And the weekly was a way for people from all of these disparate movements. He had a, a fellow who was called Jennings Perry, who was a southerner who'd been a columnist for PM. And Stone sent him to, to um, Montgomery to, uh, to talk to Ralph Abernathy and to write about this young preacher that he'd been hearing of called... Martin Luther King. Now one of the reasons he'd heard about Martin Luther King is because uh, when Rosa Parks got arrested, the first person she called was Edie Nixon, who was the head of the uh, NAACP in, in Montgomery. The first person Edie Nixon called was Clifford Durr, who was a lawyer and who was one of I.F. Stone's best friends. Um, so, you know, there was a sense that there was dissent. Uh, it wasn't in the mainstream media. It, it was suppressed. It wasn't reported. But it was happening and one of the things the weekly did is it, it put people in touch with each other.